the book has a lot of practical tools, and one of them is to help leaders have more situational awareness or situational fluency, meaning they need to know what's actually going on as opposed to relying on some idea of what's going on that's 10 years out of date. I find, I talk to business and political leaders, and they'll say, all the jobs are going to China. And you say, well, that was true 10 years ago, but it's not true now. So this question of how to improve situational fluency, I know you've had some strong views about data versus sense of what's going on, the mood, the Yeah, and, and so we know a lot about big data. We've got more data than ever before about customers and about markets. So we can analyze and, and slice and dice that data. Uh, and the problem with data is that, by its very nature, it's historic. And it tells us what's actually happened. It doesn't tell, it doesn't tell us that a new cycle might be about to occur. And uh, the other thing that senior leadership thinks about the data is that when they gather enough data about individuals and customers and markets that they can see more transparently through to them without, strangely, without recognizing that's a two-way mirror in that those people can also see their leaders much more clearly and much more transparency, with much more transparency. So the data works both ways in that respect. Yeah, actually, I love this idea that it's almost like there's so many data points, it creates like almost a holographic sphere of information that behaves like a crystal ball. And leaders are going to be able to conjure forth answers from that crystal ball that are more accurate, more precise than anything we've ever seen. This is, this is how we'll solve cancer and, and address many practical problems. But equally, it turns around and reveals leaders to their followers and the public in a way of radical transparency that they have not really got their heads around yet. And there's this notion that somehow that all you need in a leadership position is this. Uh, when in reality, a lot of the people that you're leading want this. Mm -hmm. And so that is not something you can quantify or look at in the short term. These are a set of values and a set of beliefs. But when you talk about faith and belief and trust, you're talking about things which are really of the right brain, not of the left brain. They're not teaching you about that at university, unless you're studying theology or something like that. Mm -hmm. They're not teaching you about some of these things which mean so much to their leaders because it's not a breakdown in intellect that we're talking about with leaders. It's a breakdown in imagination and trust that could not these leaders have seen that rigging a LIBOR rate or rigging an interest rate or creating a Ponzi scheme would have been found out by somebody. Could they not have had the imagination to see that? It certainly wasn't a lack of data yeah. or a lack of intellect. In fact, I think Bernie Madoff probably had a fine intellect. It wasn't particularly well applied, <laughs> but uh, this is, without the faith and without the trust and the moral compass that's yeah. there, and this is something that when it comes back to the leadership uh, issue, is that people are looking for more than just short-term performance. They're looking for a moral compass. So this is why another lesson we have in the book is that leaders don't just need a to-do list. They need a to-be list because who you are is part of your leadership task and conveying that through your actions, not just through what you do through the course of the day. Well, it's the, in these days, when you're looking at a more atomized audience, uh, and, the, and the internet is making things more and more atomized and people less likely to take any form of collective identity, mm -hmm. then actually a leader can't be a leader unless they actually have a group of people to lead. And if they don't identify as a group, then the leader has to be able to apply these values to say, we don't care your point of provenance, whether, whether you're male or female or young or old, or what your ethnicity is or disability, we actually care about being aligned around the same values and so that's why the leader has to have the to be list because it's not just about process competence well and it's also not just about bottom line and i always love the quote from peter drucker the great management guru who said it's not enough uh, to be profitable you have to be profitable that's a given because otherwise you're out of business the real question is what social purpose does your organization serve because if it doesn't serve one, it will have no staying power. It'll have no trust. A brand has no meaning unless you have that. And that's true whether you're in politics, whether you're in business, running religious organizations. This, what do you stand for, is mm. the key. Well, this is the thing when people in whatever walk of life they're lead, leading, uh, they talk about stakeholders, they talk about colleagues, they talk about clients, they talk about the company. But really the fourth C that's missing with all of that is the community. And most uh, chief executive officers don't describe themselves as community leaders because that implies some sort of woolly, intangible uh, measurement. And so strangely, we've seen now uh, the trend in the voluntary sector 
for them all to be called chief executive officers <laughs> in, uh, in charitable organisations. So when in reality, what we're talking about is a custodian of community values, not just for the short term, but for the long term and for the benefit of the whole community, not just a few.